Okay, my friends, language, history, and context, what does it do? It will unlock your English Bible. Again, language, history, and context. And we're going to be on our way to a powerful study into the book of Jonah with yours truly, Keith Johnson. Okay, my friends, grab your favorite English translation, or two if you have them, and let's get started. Now, I'm here with my Hebrew Bible. I've got the translations of the NIV and the JPS. Why did I pick those two? The NIV, basically a Christian translation. The JPS, the Jewish Publication Society, that's a Jewish translation. And between the two, we're able to find some wonderful things. Let's get started right away with Jonah chapter one, verse one. Here's what both of these translations say Word for word, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. We should just be able to say that's it. Let's move on. Except in this Bible study, we love to go a little bit deeper. So as I'm looking at my Hebrew Bible, and I've got my JPS, and I've got my NIV, I'm going to look and see what it says. The first word that comes up is the word vayihi. Now, here's what's exciting about this. You don't have to know how to read Hebrew. I'm going to do a transliteration. So I've got the Hebrew. I've got a transliteration and I've got their translations. And so between the three, we're gonna be able to, uh, to get to the bottom of this situation. So this exact form, vayihi, occurs more than 1,000 times in the Hebrew Bible and is translated up to, drum roll please, <laughs> 40 different English words, including words like came, become, been, have, come, became, had, happened, just to name a few. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep moving on. We wanna understand what this word means in Hebrew, but we also wanna understand what the English translators are doing. It's often used to start a narrative. So for example, in Joshua chapter one, verse one, it says, after the death of Moses, and that's how the actual uh, section starts, vayihi. The first word is also in the books of Judges, First and second Samuel, Ezekiel, Ruth, and I love Esther chapter one, verse one. It actually translates this word as it happened. So let's move on. The next word, devar, vayehi devar. Now this is where things get <laughs> really interesting. Uh, there are probably 20 or so different English words that are used for this one Hebrew word. Uh, that in, the, in fact, in the NIV, they use 20 different uh, English words for this word. In our verse, we're actually going to focus on three English words. The words are word, matter, or thing. If I'm looking at my Hebrew Bible and I come across this word, I know there's a, a variety of options of what I could translate it into, but the three that we're going to focus on is word, matter, or thing. Now, when I go to this next, <laughs> this next word, I have to be honest with you folks, I'm not gonna go into great depth about this word, and the reason I'm not gonna go into great depth about this word is I've written an entire book on this word, four letters, yud Hey vav Hey. it's the book, his Hollywood name revealed again, all the information, inspiration, and revelation you wanna have about it, plus I've created an entire uh, uh, what do I call it, uh, uh, Name of God resource guide where there's over 50 presentations from just a number of people on the importance of this name. What we find, however, in these three words is something really, really powerful. Vayihi is a verb. Devar is a noun. yud he vav he is the word, the, the personal name of God. What's really, really exciting is the word Vayihi and the word, and actually I'm, I'm translating this word as Yehovah, the word Vayahi and Yehovah come from the same root. So we have sandwiched between this word, matter, or thing, this verb, Vayahi, and the meaning of this name, he was, he is, and he shall be. Now, like I said, I could go on and on. We find this three word combination 83 times, but only once 
Can I say that again? But only once does it begin an entire book, which happens to be our book here in Jonah. The next part is the word that we would think, I mean, it's just the word Jonah, right? It says, Vayihi Devar Yehovah El, and in Hebrew, it's Yonah. Now, here's where my friend, Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yehuda, who I talked about in the introduction of our series, uh, told me something really powerful. He says that Hebrew names are like gunpowder that blow up <laughs> the entire verse. And in this situation, if we slow down and take a closer look, we find that the name Yonah is really, really significant. Let's do this. Let's go a little deeper into language, history, and context on the name Yonah. If I open my Bible to Genesis chapter 8, verse 6, it says this. Then it came about at the end of 40 days, then he, Noah, sent out a, and what the word is we see in English is the word dove. However, in Hebrew, the word is ha Yona. Ha represents the. Yona represents the word dove. So <laughs> this is kind of exciting. Noah sent out ha Yona, the dove, from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the ha Yona, the dove, found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all of the earth. So he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent out the Hayona, the dove, from the ark. The dove, Hayona, came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Folks, I gotta tell you something. If we, if we just slow down just a little bit, what could possibly be the connection between this man named Yona, and if we know anything about the story, who goes out into the water, and this dove, Hayona, who also goes out over the water? And yeah, I wonder if we go even further, but I tell you what, let's not go any further right now because this gets so exciting. When I have language, history, and context, and I'm taking a look at my English translations, and I've got my Hebrew Bible right in front of me, I'm telling you folks, it's like watching HDTV. And that's exactly what we're gonna keep on doing as we continue in this deep dive Bible study with yours truly, Keith Johnson. Can you say lightning strikes twice? I said after the first book, I wasn't gonna write a second one, but as a result of the first book, there's an amazing line in the prayer that Yeshua, Jesus taught, the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew, it says this, Avinu Shabashabayim, our Father who is in heaven, and then he uses these words, Yit Kadesh Shimcha, your name be sanctified, which happens to also be the exact same way that it's spoken, not in the language, but the meaning in the Greek New Testament. But in English, we lose it because we say, hallowed be thy name, which is sort of a spiritual, holy thought. Oh yes, hallowed be thy name. But in the Hebrew and in the Greek, what he was saying is, your name be sanctified, which is a call to action. But the question has to be asked, what name am I to sanctify? Well, what I decided to do was to take over the last 10 years, all the information I've been given, all of the possibilities, the opportunities to interact with Hebrew manuscripts and the Greek manuscripts and to bring it all together and to really focus on this name, this name that unfortunately has become quite controversial in a number of places. What I've decided to do is to let you get a chance to see the information for yourself. So I wrote this book, His Hollywood Name Revealed, and then it's used the word again, because this was a name that was spoken throughout the Old Testament. It was spoken throughout the New Testament. However, as a result of tradition, we've been kept from the actual name. There's now information that's been released where we can actually see this name the way it was spoken 2,000 years ago, and can I say, 3,500 years ago. The name was meant to be spoken. It shows up 6,827 times according to the most accurate Hebrew manuscripts. You can actually learn this name right here in this book, but I'm most excited about this. In the back of the book, 80 different Hebrew descriptions that give people a chance to interact with this name in their devotional life, in their prayer life, and in their daily life. So, his Hollywood name revealed again an opportunity to, to interact with the information, the inspiration, and the revelation about the name which he says in the scriptures, he will make us know.
Welcome back, my friends. We were dealing with this name, Yonah, that we find in Genesis, which also means dove. And if we do a little bit of language, history, and context, we're going to find some really exciting things. Let's look at a little bit of history. What we know is that Yonah, or Jonah, depending on how you want to pronounce it, was a prophet during the reign of King Jeroboam. Now, here's what I'd like to do. I want to go to 2 Kings chapter 14, 23. And here's what it says. In other words, up to this point, all we hear is, Yonah, and then we're going to hear something else about him, but we don't know who he was, short of the fact that if we do a little digging, we can find his name one other time in all of Scripture. In 2 Kings chapter 14, 23, it says this, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. Let's slow down there for just a second. We know that Israel uh, is the northern kingdom and Judah is the southern kingdom. So we're at the place now where there's been a split and you've got kings in Judah and you've got kings in Samaria. He did evil in the sight of yud heh vav -Hey, the Lord in English, Yehovah in Hebrew. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin. And here is where it gets interesting. He restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of yud heh vav -Hey, the Lord, the God of Israel. And here's the interesting part. We got to slow down. Which he spoke through his servant, Yonah. Jonah, for those that are reading in English. His servant, Yonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gath Hefer. We now know that Yonah, if we are reading this in, the all, in all of Scripture, that this is the same Yonah that we find in this book. Now, how do we know that? If we go just a little further in this verse, it says this. The word of the Lord in English came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Who is Amittai? Obviously, that's his father. And when you get to a situation where someone is being defined, in fact, and he's having a father, then we're no like this isn't some like literary uh, you know invention of this person named Jonah. He actually is a person. And, and what's interesting about it is the meaning of the name Amitai. You're not going to see this in English. Here's what the meaning of the name Amitai is: my truth. <laughs> Did you catch that? So Jonah's father's name is. My truth, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 28. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. It's the, it's the root word emet. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but that, that is kind of exciting. You know, as I mentioned, Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yehuda says, Keith, when you come across uh, Hebrew names, Oftentimes, they're like gunpowder. Now, this is one of those things where I can kind of feel like I've lit the, uh, the fuse and it's kind of going through the verse. Zzz, Jonah, Yonah, the dove, son of Amittai, my truth. Pretty interesting. Now, here's where things get a little more interesting. In the JPS and the NIV, they do something, and I have to, let me, let me slow down and say something. Uh, the JPS and the NIV for Jonah chapter one, verse one, they translate from the Hebrew word for word. That means that if you're looking at the translation of the JPS and you're looking at the translation of the NIV, those translators of the NIV and those translators of the JPS are looking at what I'm looking at here. What do I have here? My favorite book the Hebrew Bible. This is actually the book that Yeshua, Jesus, would have read from. So this is my favorite book. And when I look at that book, if I was on the translation committee, you've got the Jewish translators, you've got the Christian translators, and then you got me. We're all looking at the same verse. Vayhi divar Yehovah Eliona then Amitai Lemor. Now that last word, Lemor, you say, where is that translated in the NIV in the JPS? We don't see it. They actually didn't translate that word. And there's a reason that they didn't do that. Uh, I would say this, that uh, there are several translations that do add it. Jonah chapter one, verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, that's the NASB and the ASV, they actually translate the word Lamor. But here's how I see this, and thanks to my friend, uh, Rabbi Dr. David Moster. He's the person that I called when I said, listen, Dr. Moster, I'm about to bring this information to people around the world. I want you to check me. I want you to make sure. I want you, iron sharpens iron. And here's one of the things he said. He said that this word actually most of the time could be seen as an idiom. 
Uh, it's actually functioning as a quotation marker for the next verse. Oh, boy, oh boy, <laughs> we're getting excited now, the next verse. Here's what I wanna do. I now wanna take you this verse, Vayihi, Devar, Yehovah, Eliona, then Amitai, Leamor. Now I'm gonna give you the section we call <laughs> Lost in Translation. <laughs> this is the Keith Johnson version, and I wanna take some time and share this verse with you. If I were translating it, if they invited me into the translation committee, I would have said, let's translate it this way, based on the language, the history, and the context of what is being said in the Hebrew. I would say it this way. Uh, now it happened that the matter of Yehovah manifested to Jonah, son of Amittai. Quote, we don't know how the matter manifested. Was it a dream? Was it a vision? Was it a visitation? Was it a sign, a wonder, or an audible voice? We don't know why it manifested to Jonah, son of Amittai. We just know that it did. And here is the question. If the word, the matter, our thing that is in the heart of Yehovah manifests to you, are you ready, willing, and able to respond. I, I, I love this, you all, I gotta tell you. I, I get so excited to have my Hebrew Bible. I get so excited for the work of our English translators. I love to use them. They, they give me a chance to find out where the issues are, but when I see where the issues are, that the JPS and the NIV kind of said, ah, the word of the Lord came. No, 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 no. In Hebrew, that thing happened. And when it happened, it manifested itself. And when it manifested itself, it manifested itself to Yonah, son of Amittai. And here comes the quote, but that's in the next verse. And I will wait to see you right after this. The Chronological Gospels Bible is changing lives all over the world, putting everything the Messiah did in exact chronological order and explaining the behind the scenes truth of what the Messiah did, when he did it, and why. The timing of it all means everything. And now, the Chronological Gospels can be easier on your eyes. The larger print edition features 40% larger type, and every page appears exactly the same as the original, so you can follow along with others who have the regular size version. The Chronological Gospels larger print edition also has wider margins to write notes, and the premium quality paper means you can highlight without soaking through. Plus. The larger print edition lies flat, so you can teach without having to hold the book open. The Chronological Gospels larger print edition is a big and beautiful coffee table book, measuring a full 12 inches tall and 9 inches wide. Study the Bible with clarity and ease. I love the size of this book. This is nine by 12. The paper is, is perfect because it doesn't bleed through when I write on it. I can mark it up and I always make notes in all my Bibles. Everything is the same place as it is on the smaller version and I can just stand back and I can teach from it and it's just, it's the perfect size. I pray thee, of whom speaks this prophet? Order the Chronological Gospels larger print edition by phone or online. You'll get 40% larger type than the original. Call 800-788-7887. That's 800-788-7887. Or get the Chronological Gospels Bible larger print edition online at arudawakening.tv slash large. Welcome back, my friends. I, I apologize for getting so excited about this. I probably should back up a little bit. My name's Keith Johnson of Biblical Foundations Academy International. Our mission is to inspire people from around the world to build a biblical foundation for their faith. But I have to tell you something. When I decided to do uh, this Bible study, things happened so fast, and, and, but I, I had to make two phone calls. The first call, phone call I made was to a Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Now, Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yehuda is the grandson of Eliezer Ben Yehuda, the very man that helped to resurrect the Hebrew language in the land of Israel. In other words, they considered it almost, and I say this carefully, almost like it was a dead language. It wasn't being used. It certainly wasn't the language of the land of Israel uh, some you know, 100, 150 years ago, it's other than in pockets. And what he did is he decided that he really wanted to see uh, this language to be used. And now if you go to Israel, people from all over the world uh, are speaking this language, you know, one tongue, uh, the Hebrew language. And he was key to that. Well, his grandson, 
is Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yehuda. And I called him, I said, hey Rabbi, I'm about to uh, uh, try something. I'm gonna try to bring everything I know, um, language, history, and context together uh, on the book of Jonah. And he, he, he perked up and he, he said, oh really, you wanna do that? And so what he, and he's a scholar by the way, other than being a great man, I spent Passover with he and his wife Leah down in Florida and that was, it was just, I mean, he invited me down there and it was just amazing to be with him in the synagogue and to be at his table and to just hear him speak. But he right away clicked in and he said, Keith, I, I wanna tell you something. Uh, when you talk about the book of Jonah, there's a bit of controversy about it. There's some folks that would have said it should have never been in the canon. There are others who say it's not a book that should be taken seriously. Others would say, well, we, you know, maybe, maybe some parts of it could be considered uh, truth. But uh, he said there's another group of people who say that it's actually very important. So important that in every Yom Kippur, the book of Jonah is read in synagogues around the world. Let me say that again. He told me, every year at Yom Kippur, the book of Jonah is read in synagogues around the world. Now, take that with another statement, it was the Sonsino commentary he told me, that was inside synagogue some years ago that everybody would read these commentaries, and here's what it said in the commentary. The book of Jonah is the most ill-used and least understood of all the books of the Tanakh. He says, however, both personally and professionally, I don't think that any other book in the entire scriptures is any more or any less important than Jonah, except the Torah, he says. He says it's not taken seriously, but it's read, as he mentioned, in every single uh, book. Now, I, I spent some time with him talking about the book of Jonah. That was my first phone call, and what, what a good one that was. The second phone call I made was to Rabbi Dr. David Moster. He's got his PhD in biblical studies from Bar-Alan University in Israel. And I gotta tell you, uh, I called him and I said, hey, here's what I'm wanting to do, and here's what we've been doing, and, and here's what I'm hoping to do. And he jumped up right away, he said, Keith, I'll help any way you can. And we did what we call a biblical Hebrew intensive, sharpening reading and grammatical understanding, updating the use of study tools, and expanding my translation skills. Now, <laughs> I have to tell you all, I am in a long-term battle with popular English translations, and I love to offer the KJV the Keith Johnson version, when the original Hebrew stands in stark opposition to the English translations. I call this section in our deep dive Bible study, Lost in Translation. I asked Dr. Moster, it's what I said to him, I said, Dr. Moster, I want you to challenge me if I venture too far off into the English translation, actually I should say, too far off the English translation farm. And I know some folks are gonna say, you're well off the farm, but here's what's great. Uh, I actually like the Living Bible. I don't like that the Living Bible takes um, uh, some, some, it goes way far away from the actual original meaning. What I do like about it is the language that they use that makes it um, applicable to us today. So what I'm doing is I'm doing this. I'm looking at the Hebrew. I'm looking at the translations. I'm even being challenged by a PhD from bar -Alan University. Hey, Keith, uh, your translation is spot on in terms of what it means. Again, what was the translation? that this word, this matter, this thing of Yehovah manifested to Jonah, son of Amittai. And here comes the quote. I tell you what, folks, I'm gonna do something really radical, and let me just make this announcement right now. I actually spent some time several years ago doing a biblical Hebrew audio course, and here's what I'm doing for the first seven verses of Jonah. I'm making the entire course free. Did you hear that? Say free. The first seven verses, which we're gonna go through, hopefully, in this pilot series, these first seven verses, I'm gonna give you language, history, and context. I'm gonna give you access to the actual Hebrew language, but more than that, I'm gonna let you learn how to read it for yourself. I love this. If there's anything I am committed to, it is this. I don't want you to walk away and say, Keith said, I want you to walk away and say, Here's what the Word of God said, and here's how I understand it, and how I want to apply it into my life. I am overwhelmed with joy that you're here. I am excited that you're here. We're just now scratching the surface. We just put our toe in the water. But let's keep on by taking a deep dive Bible study into the book of Jonah. Visit bfainternational.com today and join our online academy for free you'll get immediate access to start watching all of Keith Johnson's latest programs, including the Time Will Tell series, Rediscovering God's Clock from Israel and Beyond, the Now is the Time miniseries, based in New York City and Washington, D.C. 
The Road to Reformation, a 10-step study for biblical reformation. The Open Door series, 18 hours of exciting teaching from a national speaking tour, His Hallowed Name, a series on God's name that was banned from TV. Also, hear directly from Keith Johnson through weekly personal blog updates. Why delay? Visit bfainternational.com right now. Then click the Enter the Academy button. Visit us today. Okay, my friends, you heard the word lemor, which we're using as an idiom, which means it is a quotation mark of what is coming. Think about this. This quotation mark is going to be a quotation mark that's going to let us know that the next word we hear in the book of Jonah comes from the Almighty the creator of the universe, the one that in according to the oldest, most complete Hebrew manuscripts, his name is Yehovah, and he's about to speak. And I think this is exciting, but let's slow down just a little bit. I wanna make sure that you all understand what I said in the previous uh, section. I'm actually making available right now for you to learn biblical Hebrew. Don't get overwhelmed. I don't know, if, I don't know, I don't think I told you this. In the first seven verses in the book of Jonah, every consonant that exists in the Hebrew language is in those first seven verses. Every vowel that exists in the Hebrew language is in those first seven verses. Now, there's one vowel that is spoken the same way, but it looks different, and there are a couple consonants that are in final forms, like at the end of the word, that don't exist in those seven verses, but here's what's good news. Those seven verses have the entire biblical Hebrew consonants and vowels, just about, and you get to learn them for yourself. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start this series by dedicating an entire episode to each of the first seven verses in Jonah. Did you catch it? This is a deep dive Bible study. In other words, every single verse in Jonah chapter one, verses one through seven, we're gonna dedicate an entire episode. Now, before we start the next one, go over to bfainternational.com, sign up as a free. <laughs> look at your neighbor, look at your dog, look at your husband, look at your wife, look at your kids and say, did he just say free? Free! <laughs> the first seven verses, the first seven uh, lessons, the first seven episodes that we're gonna do gives you all the access for yourself. And I'm hoping that you're gonna take advantage of this so that you can continue with us in this deep dive Bible study into the book of Jonah.